When you look for, at a quarterback, you look at both mental and physical qualities. I think his mental qualities are most important because he's the leader. He's the one that directs the football team. His confidence and his poise go a long way in determining how good a football team you're going to be. Of course, physically, he has to have that ability to, to handle the ball. He's got to have the ability to, to throw the football successfully. And if he has those qualities, then you have a pretty good chance to have the right leadership at the quarterback position. Quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks is Jim Zorn, and he's known for his razzle-dazzle, scramble, go get him aggressive type of football play. And Jim, it's fun to have you on and uh, you. to be talking about the position of quarterback. And I guess probably a thing that a quarterback has to struggle with more than anything else is his attitudes and his relationships, and he gets all the praise or he gets all the blame and, and those kinds of things. And, and I know, Jimmy, that uh, with a young team like the Seattle Seahawks, uh, there's been a rise and some really good play, and there have been some days and even some seasons when it's been a terrible struggle. And uh, how do you maintain, first of all, that emotional control within yourself? I try to put myself in the proper perspective. Uh, if you're in high school, you're playing for uh, this certain high school, you happen to be the bona fide quarterback for that school, or you're trying to become that, uh, just understand where you're at. And then consider <clears throat> where other people are at around you, your teammates, your coaching staff, your friends, uh, your parents, your family. You've got to uh, just think about it. That's all, just think about it and realize that you just happen to be in this certain position at this particular time. And the reason I say think about it, because once you start believing what other people are saying, newspapers or your friends are building you up like you're um, taller than Norm Evans, <laughs> and you start believing that, you're really uh, in a position where you're uh, becoming unrealistic about where you are actually uh, at. So I think about it, I say, okay, here's where I'm at. I'm a quarterback. I play with the Seattle Seahawks. I still have parents. I still have a, my family. I've got friends. I've got teammates. I've got coaches. And I am me. And I'm not anybody else. I'm not who, they, who pe some people say I am. I know exactly where I'm at, exactly where I'm going. And then I think during the season, it can carry right over. You can, you can be level-headed. You can be in control because you realize that you're just a quarterback, that you're no superstar better than anybody else on your team. Uh, you don't have anything over anybody. If I am going to uh, be able to do the job and to be able to complete the passes, hand the ball off, uh, be the leader that I can be on the team, I'm going to have to concentrate and work harder than anybody else on the team. Quarterbacks are a special little breed. We are just weird. We're different, and we know it, but, and, and there's a lot of work to do because of it, but we're not, you know, we're not better than you. Nor, well, I you know, know Jim, but offensive linemen know you quarterbacks are a little weird, yeah, and that's we okay. Talking about your relationship with your offensive linemen, what are some of the things as a quarterback uh, you can do to make sure those guys know you appreciate them and all those kinds of things? What do you do? There's, there's some very good things that I can say uh, one of them would be to be in the weight room with them. Offensive linemen, you guys work out so hard. And quarterbacks have this reputation of just going out and eh, you know, toss the ball for half an hour or so here or there to their receivers and everything's cool and you run a couple sprints and uh, you act like you've done everything in the world and it's so hard to play quarterback. Yet you don't spend the time with the people who are uh, sacrificing their bodies for you. So I feel that uh, since I've become a professional and even in college, I was in the weight room working out with the guys and, and I couldn't lift as much as these guys and some of them would hey, you know, feel my little <laughs> skin and bones but the attitude that I was taking was it wasn't so much how much I could lift, it was the time spent with them and as I got involved with it, I really enjoyed the weightlifting and it's proven to be uh, a very important aspect of my football uh, playing right now, my weightlifting. What about the rest of the team? You have a very unique 
relationship with your receivers and those guys in the backfield because you spend so much time together. Um, again, how do you maintain that relationship? Well, Norm, it's a lot easier to maintain a relationship with a receiver, seeing that you should be spending all your time uh, away from the, uh, while you're away from the weight room or anything else. The rest of that time needs to be devoted to throwing the ball, talking with your receivers, uh, spending time with them just out in the street, uh, talking about the game. What do, you, what do you feel when you're doing this? What do I, here's how I feel when I'm throwing this. I feel rushed here. I feel too slow here. Uh, all this constant jabbering back and forth can really, really uh, aid during a game because you know each other a lot better. And I seem to do, quarterbacks and receivers, quarterbacks and running backs seem to develop relationships a lot easier than the, uh, any defensive players or, or offensive linemen. What about uh, in the huddle? How does a quarterback maintain huddle control? I maintain my huddle control by uh, shelling out authority to somebody else. So I give my offensive center the authority to maintain the huddle control. He, see, I, then I don't have to talk to everybody on the, on the team inside the huddle. I can just talk to John Yarno or Art Kuhn or whoever's the center in there. Those guys, uh, I can pull over to the side and just say, the huddle is noisy, I can't hear myself. You, it's your job, you know it is, you take it, you do it. So that kind of keeps me away and then I can think about other things. Okay, Jim, now you're, you've been in the huddle, you break out of the huddle, you run up to the line of scrimmage, you stand there as all quarterbacks do, and you give her a look. What are the kinds of things you're looking at? Well, every single time I walk up to the line of scrimmage, I have got to see what's down in front of me, what's facing my offensive linemen. The next people that I look at are the linebackers, and I see kind of where they're at. And then the next would be the... Uh, secondary and I see where they're at but once you walk up to the line of scrimmage things start happening very fast because you have only got a certain amount of time to get this ball snap so you've called this play and you've got to look in about one or two seconds if this play is going to work and feel like it is and you set your team the defense starts moving around and now you decide okay this play is not going to work I, I see this strong safety over here this guy right over here Who's, who usually plays over the tight end, he's kind of sneaking over and he's getting head up over my tight end instead of being wide. Now, if he's wide, could be a zone, or he could be trying to fake him out, but I think he's going to play zone. If he's head up and he's intent, this, he's going to cover this guy man for man. So if I had a zone route on, I might want to change it with an audible. If, if I had a man for man route on, I'd be licking my chops. Now, that, you might look at the strong safety on one certain play. And then the next play you, you call, you have another pass route, and you're looking at a weak side linebacker. Now why the difference? Because the key's different? That's the one guy you want to know about? Each play that we have, and I'm sure uh, in high school or college, wherever you're at, you've got an objective for a certain play. No play is designed uh, totally to go 100 yards for a touchdown. Not every play. Coaches would like them to think they would, but they don't because defenses are, are, are good too. So each play has an objective. And one play you might be reading a strong safety. One play you might read the weak side linebacker. If he blitzes, uh, you do something. If he doesn't blitz, you look at somebody else on the same pattern. So you've got to discipline yourself to know your plays, really, don't you? Mm, you've how, got to be sure. How sharp. much time do you spend studying in a week before you walk up to the line of scrimmage for the first play of the game? I put in between 45 and 50 hours a week total. Now that's on the field and off the field. But on the field, we spend two and a half hours a day. So you times that by five or six, and how much is that? That's about 12, four, 12 to 15 of those 50 hours are just spent on the field. The rest of it is spent watching film. And in high school, it's tough to watch films of other teams, especially when I was in high school. I don't know about it now because there's not much of it. But in college, there's a lot of film to watch. And in professional football, film can tell you so much about a team. But you've got to develop the skill of watching film. And that can happen by asking your coach, can you tell me what to watch here? So many coaches might just say, you've got to watch this film. And players will go in and watch it, 
but they're watching the other quarterback, and he's got a great release <laughs> when you should be watching the defense. So you got to learn how to watch the film, how to study, get yourself ready. Now you're up there, you've broken the huddle, <clears throat> and you're raring to go, and you've got the snap count. Can the snap, the snap count really is the advantage the offense has. It's they know when they're going, and you, so how do you use that to your advantage? And it's a weapon. It's a weapon for a quarterback. It can, it can be used so well uh, that a team will never know when you're gonna, when you're gonna be coming off the ball. The sorry thing is that so many coaches get afraid because during practice sessions, during practice sessions, a coach will want to save time by always going on the same count. And a team, an offensive line, running backs, uh, the whole team will get so conditioned to this one snap count that during a game, that's the only count you can go on. On the Seahawks, we have to develop different snap counts every single practice, meaning that I can't go on, this, on a two count if we had a two count going, I can't go on a two count every time. I've got to switch it up. So we go on a quick count, uh, kind of another type of quick count. We go on a one, two, three, four, or we even go on a five count. Five huts. We, we use huts. Hut one. No, not hut one. Hut, 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 hut. These types of things. Now, voice inflection is the other thing that's very important. On the Seahawks, we call out a we call out the defense and then dummy audible numbers, audible numbers. So I get up 4 3, set. 4 3 was a defense. Set sets my team. Now I call out my dummy audible numbers or an audible if I see it. 187, 187. And notice that I look one way and then I look the other way. Some teams have quarterbacks that will keep looking where, keep looking where the play is going to be. And, and other teams can pick this up. Do you always look to the left and then the right? I always look to my left. 187, it doesn't matter if, if that's the strong side or the weak side. I always look to my left, then I look to my right, and then I look ahead, and then I keep my head on a swivel. See, you've got to be seeing things all over the place. You can't just look, you can't just look one way and the other and then expect everything to be okay. You've got to keep your head. You've got to keep looking. So I've called it 188, 188. And it's on two. So the next time, see, I'm going to be real sneaky. And I walk up to the line of scrimmage, and now I've called it on two again. 188, 188. Hut, hut. And now, this is its third down. It's a crucial situation. I walk up to the line of scrimmage, but I've called it on three. See, I've called it on three. 186, 186. Hut, hut. And everybody goes, those defensive linemen just they just get used to your snap count. They get used to hearing you. They're not they're not supposed to. Their coaches would say, what, go in the ball snap. But they get used to it. And you go, hut, hut, and your offense just stays there like studs. And then you hit that third hut and you're off. And when you can get a defense off balance like that, it's a weapon. And you can do it on a two count, a three count. A four count, so you use one to, to do the other, and you've got to switch them up at practice all the time, because if you don't, uh, you're, you're going to be in this one groove, and you can only go on one snap count, and then you're, a bo you're in bondage, you're a slave of that snap count, and that's not what any coach wants. And the, and the cadence is the, probably the greatest weapon that an offensive lineman has. Now then, you go through the cadence. Now you're going to take the snap. What are the different? What do you do to take the snap? What What are the important things? Well, there's there's three or four ways you can hold your hands. I am left-handed, but I can. Uh, I'll show you both ways for a right-hander and a left-hander. Some coaches teach the quarterback to put their top hand underneath the center's butt, right in the middle of his hind end, and the opposite hand, or you, the hand that you are. The hand that you're weakest would go underneath. So your strong hand would be on top. If you're right-handed, it'd be your right hand. If I, I'm left-handed, so it's my left hand. So we have both of the hands that are in a, in, a, in a shape of a cup. Your strong hand on top, the other hand underneath. And when the ball comes up, it'll just slip right around there. Now, this, all that I've just showed you, I feel is a weak way to take the snap. And it uh, only because of one thing. It, it 
your arm is forced underneath. So look at my shoulder. It's, I feel very cramped in here. I've got to get down farther than I really want to get down to take the ball. So when your elbow is underneath here and you're trying to move your hand so you can take it, you're in a, a little bit of an awkward position. Number two snap count. I mean, the number two way to take the snap would be some coaches feel that if your hands are like this, like a spread eagle, your thumbs are together, and some coaches teach to interlock your thumb because then your hands won't come apart and the ball won't come flipping up in your face. So some coaches teach to cross your thumbs or to put your thumbs together, and then the ball, when the ball comes up, the, your hands automatically just go around. And then the center, the center won't have the problem of finding the space where your top hand is it's because he's just, he's just snapping it up to his butt. But there's a problem here too because most of the time this, is, this, this can be the second best but a lot of the time your hands do split apart and that ball if the center snaps the ball a little bit deep you've got nothing back here to protect it from shooting up okay so this is probably the second best because it frees you up you can stand actually almost straight up and take a snap if you've got a center that's tall the way that I I take the center snap and this is the way that Jim Zorn feels it's the best and what I've learned to be the best is it's a combination be between both of these I put my hand up on the top of the center's butt underneath it right in the middle because I feel like if I can give him the proper pressure he can feel a spot on his butt where he's gonna snap the ball this way he's feeling too he's feeling both hands he's not really sure where he's gonna snap it and this way it cramps this arm. But with this arm, instead of bringing it down here, the only thing I do, and it's so simple, is I just roll it to the side. I put it flat against the guy's leg. That's all. And it just frees my arm up, just like that. It just, it just does that. And it, it, makes, it makes everything so comfortable. He's still got the pressure underneath his hind end, but this hand is freed up and you can get out of there. So what happens is the ball is snapped and this hand this hand gets the ball and this all this hand does is by this time you should be getting out of there anyway and this hand just rolls around and takes the ball and it's so quick so this would be the best one for me and the one that I would suggest that everybody does but coaches are different and you've got to remember the way that your coach wants you to take the snap is exactly the way that he feels it's the best for the team and each coach could be different down the way but you've got to go by what your coach says and you just got to maybe talk to him about it all right now Jim you've got the, you have the ball in your hand you're, you're either you're gonna hand the ball off one way or the other or you're gonna drop back for a pass talk to us about motion quarterback motion how do you control yourself behind the center first of all on a run okay the first thing when you're walking up to the line of scrimmage you got to get into to a stance and my stance if we'll look at my feet if I'm facing the line of scrimmage and the ball is here and I'm facing the line of scrimmage my, um, uh, by my center, I like to be in a comfortable position so I can escape one way or the other as quick as I possibly can. Now I've seen high school quarterbacks and they're in here like this and I'm not sure I would like to play quarterback from this position here. There's some quarterbacks that have their feet so spread apart that there's no way they can actually leave the center as quick as they as quick as they can because they've put themselves in a very poor position so you get your you get your feet properly aligned or you can you can escape one way or you can escape the other way as quickly as you possibly can and I try to point my toes slightly inward if you have your toes out in this position you cannot drive off your leg as well as you can if you have your toes slightly pointed inward. Toes slightly pointed inward allows you to just drive one way or the other or straight back if you want. Okay? And that's very, very important. So we don't want to be like this. We don't want to be like this. We want to be in a comfortable position where we can escape one way or the other or back and do what we want. All right, now when you're going back, well, what's your technique that you use there? Okay, the technique for dropping back, and I will show you today, a three-step drop, a five-step drop, and a seven-step drop. 
and then we'll get into rolling out. So to drop back, first of all, you take the ball. And as soon as you receive the ball, any snap, whether it's a running play, whether it's a passing play, the ball comes directly into your gut. We never, as quarterbacks, never hold the ball out here. Never take the snap and hold the ball out to, to uh, hand it off. Always, you get the snap, it's in here, and you always, you always put it out from your chest. It's always coming out one way or the other. The ball never hangs out here. And, and it's only because we're lazy, it's only because we're sloppy if that's going on. And What are the dangers of leaving the ball out there? Well, big defensive lineman coming across and knocking the ball out of your hands. Or you could be coming around, your running back has run the wrong way. And, and you expect him to come on this side, and he comes on this side, and the ball hits him. You didn't expect him there. The ball's fumbled. Uh, keeping the ball in here allows you to be more deceptive because as soon as you turn your, your back from the line of scrimmage, you don't even know I have the ball, do you? I might have already thrown it. So the deception is very, very important because now as you're dealing with it here, you can put it out there and show it to them and pull it back in. And as long as you're dealing from inside out, he knows what I'm doing. When my arms are out like this, he knows what's happening. But if I'm in here, he doesn't know. I could give him a hand. And he might just be gullible enough to think that was the ball. Three-step drop. Now, to do the three-step drop, our, my toes are slightly pointed in. And it's a, it's a quick pass. You're going to be throwing the ball uh, seven to eight yard routes. You're going to be throwing quick screens. You're going to be throwing uh, uh, fairly quick routes. So it, it's, uh, this, this drop back is very controlled. It doesn't have to be blazing speed because in three steps, you're going to stop and you're going to deliver the ball. So we get the ball and it comes into it comes into my chest and this foot which is my right foot for right handers it would be your left foot but for me I'm left handed and I would drive off my weak foot because I'm going to end up planting on my strong foot okay so I drive off my weaker leg and so we'll call my right leg the drive leg so the drive leg is planted it doesn't lift up and it, it's, it, it doesn't waste time. There's an explosion right in this part of your body. And it's a drive, it's a push, okay? No false steps. That would be a call to false step if I was doing this. Or if I was doing this. Some quarterbacks do this. And you lose valuable time. You lose timing with your receivers. You lose timing with your offensive line. I get the ball, and I'm going to go back three steps. I'm going to walk through it. Okay, I drive off this leg, and I take a pretty good step, and then I cross over, two, and then I plant three. Now some coaches teach their kids, or, or young quarterbacks, to, after they hit that third step, to set up and then deliver the ball one way or the other. So they hit that third step, and they step up, and they deliver the ball, or they deliver the ball over the middle. But we felt on the Seahawks, and I, and I really believe this to be true now that I've, I've been into the system for five or six years, is on a three-step drop, you can't take that little shuffle step up and deliver a short pass on timing. There's no possible way. The timing is lost. So when we set up on our three-step drop, it's, it's one, two, three, throw. I'll do it again. It's one, two, three, throw. There's no shuffle step up to get ready to throw. It wastes time. <clears throat> That's why the three-step drop has to be very, very controlled, because as soon as you hit that third step, you take one step, and then the crossover, and then plant, you've got to have that leg planted in the direction you want to throw. You've already had to make that decision by looking at the defense. For example, I see that strong safety over here. This cat has been bugging me all day long. But now I see I see him. He's head up over my tight end. He's in a man coverage because he's just frothing at the mouth at, at our tight end. So I know Steve Largen over there is going to be one on one. And I've got a quick out called, a real quick out. So on my first step, I look and I see the strong safety. Yep, 
He was covering him man for man. So I know I'm going to throw to Steve now. I just know it. I don't have to look over there. I don't have to see him. I know I'm going to throw there. So one step, I know where I'm going to throw. Two, three. Now I plant myself so my third step allows me to turn and throw the ball to him. If I was going to throw to uh, Sam McCollum, I take one step, no false steps. I take one step, two step, and then on my third step, my foot is now planted to where I can just step straight forward and deliver the ball to Sam McCollum. Now I'd like to talk about the five-step drop. The five-step drop will be the, the drop back that most high schools will use if they're going to use a drop back because if they're going seven-step drop or try to get 11 yards, the receivers, the, the quarterback's arms aren't strong enough to deliver the ball 30 yards down the field on a shot and it takes a, long, a longer time to protect. So the five-step drop will probably be the most common you see in high school, and the seven I'll get into uh, would be probably better for college and pros. But the five-step drop is five-step drop. And instead of just setting up at the three, we go back two more steps, and then we take a shuffle step up, okay, to set up in the pocket, to let your lineman take these defensive ends are these blitzing linebackers out around you. So it forms a, so the line can form a cup around you. So it's the same thing. Toes slightly pointed in, don't look weird. Toes slightly pointed in, we got a drive leg, no false steps. And we go back, five step drop. I'll walk through it. Go one, two, three, four. And we hit that fifth step and we don't fall back. We plant it. And then after it's planted, then we take a step up into the pocket. And just that little step has saved my neck. So many times, just that little step up, because you, Norm, have driven guys on my blind side who have had these flailing arms coming out after me. You've driven them right by me because I've stepped up in the pocket. When I've been sacked, it's made you so mad because I've hit that fifth step and I stood straight up. And you thought I was gonna you thought I was gonna step up in the pocket, but I surprised you. And you got the blame for it until we watch films on Monday. And then I got the blame for it. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through it sort of a jogging motion, not full speed, just so you can get the idea of it. It's one, two, three, four, five, and deliver. And this is a good way to practice it, is just to understand how many steps is it. You can count to yourself. Because you'll know what your feet are doing. When your foot hits the ground, you can count how many steps you've taken back. One, two, three, four, five. Deliver. Now, Jim, why don't you talk about, just again, the beginning of a, for a right-handed quarterback. For a right-handed quarterback, he would be driving off his left leg. And watch this, folks. This will be a first. Uh, his right hand would be on top, and it would be one, two, three, four, five. This feels weird but then he would set up and throw like a real champ. <clears throat> okay, I'd like to go over the seven step drop because I feel like that's important and your coaches in high school or college, the coaches might have uh, their quarterbacks do this also. So the seven step drop, again, it's just four more than the three step drop and two more than the five step drop. Now, same thing, drive leg, and we're going back seven. Now I'm going to count it, and I'm going to say to myself, set, step, and throw, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, set, step, and throw. Okay, now, Jim, that's really great. You get back there, and it's step and throw. What if you get back there and step to throw, and there's nobody to throw to? Okay, this is where the word poise comes in. And you can't panic. When there's nobody there yet, you've got to have poise. And, and when I say wait, the waiting, most of the time, will only take a split second, but there'll be a little waiting period in there, and that's when your feet can't get the jitters, and I'll explain it as I, as I set up in my seven-step drop. So I've gone back seven steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've planted. I've set up in the pocket. Oh, where's Steve Largent? Now I can't panic. Now is where the poise comes in. So I'm going to stand there, and my... My first, my first reaction is to, as I'm dropping back, I'm reading the defense. I know what coverage they're in. I see now that uh, 
they've slid this strong safety out, and I've got Steve on a curl route, and they're going to cover him. That strong safety's no fool. So he's covered Steve Largent. He's not there. I go to my secondary receiver. And this is what's so important about knowing your plays. You've got to know where everybody is on the field. So I, I sit, and I look, I say, uh-oh, he's covered, and I just drop it right off to Dan Dornick, who's out in the flat just going, <laughs> and he's wide open. He's wide open, because that strong safety should have covered Dan Dornick, not Steve Largent. But if he'd have covered Dan Dornick, I'd have thrown it to Steve Largent, so it made no difference. He was wrong. And this is the attitude you have to take. Whatever they do out there, you're going to be wrong, because somebody's going to be open. And if, they, if they're not open, and you're standing there, and I went to throw to Steve, and he's not open, and I stepped, and I went to Dan Dornick, and he's not open, don't throw the ball. Take off, run, make something out of it. Or maybe you got a, a running back that uh, has swung out over here. Do something about it. Do not stand and get sacked. Do not stand and, and be defeated. Be tough and make something out of it. It could be, it could be running upfield straight ahead. It could be running around. It could be running up inside your offensive tackle and then back out. There's so many things that you can do after you find a receiver not open. The, the play does not end. The play does not end. Is there anything in particular, Jim, that you think about when you realize, OK, now I do have to scramble? I know from an offensive lineman's point of view, they hope you go forward, not laterally, and those kinds of things. Are there any ground rules for scrambling? There's, there's certain ground rules. I think they should be practiced also. I think scrambling can be practiced. Uh, a lot of coaches would say, well, he's got the natural ability of scrambling. I, I think there is some ability, but it doesn't have to do with scrambling. It has to do with quick feet and the, just the God-given desire not to be sacked. <laughs> I do not want to be sacked, and I've got a strong desire not to be sacked, and that really helps. So a couple of the ground rules would be to remember that as you drop back in the pocket and you set up that your offensive tackles are trying to take their man behind you and around you, especially in pro football. So one thing not to do is when you set up is to turn around and try to run backwards unless, unless the inside of the line has collapsed. Okay, but if you see they've, hold their, they've held their ground fairly well in the middle and you see your offensive tackles drawing them, drawing them up, run, run underneath them one way to the other, one way uh, it, you might be running towards the route. You might be running away from the route, wanting them to uh, come back to the other side. Uh, try to make something out of the play. I can scramble sideways, and I, and, and I can just be running, and I can just be waiting for someone to come open. You always keep your head downfield. And when you're ready, when you're prepared, you can deliver the ball. And if you don't see anybody, take off and get what you can. What about the sprint out, Jim? Well, the sprint out is probably one of our, on the Seattle Seahawks, most effective weapons because we not only use the sprint out as a running play, we use it just devastatingly as a passing play. And the reason it works so well is because we're always faking to a running back on one side or the other coming upfield and a defensive lineman won't know if he's got the ball. And just that hesitation allows us to get outside and to do the damage that we want to do. To run the sprint out, there's a couple things that are very important to remember. One is as you're taking off from the center, you've got to explode. Your first 10 yards are really important because that's what's going to get you outside of the defense. That's what's going to get you free. So the, about the first 10 yards are very, very important to explode. The second thing that's very important is to keep your head upfield. To throw the ball on the run takes a lot more practice than dropping back, handing off, because you're in a, an unbalanced, unbalanced positioning of your body. Your body is in this violent action that doesn't have anything to do with a proper technique of throwing. So what has to happen, and, and I'm going to use a couple words here, it's a controlled, frenzied state, meaning that you're 
you're sprinting out and you're running as fast as you can, yet your arm is totally under control. A lot of your body, although you'd think it was out of control, has to work with your arm that's in control. So the release will be just like you've, you've dropped back and thrown the ball, only you're, you're on the run. And if you've, and I didn't even know this, but I've looked at a lot of action shots of myself in, in a still, in a photo, and I've seen that every time that I throw a sprint out, both feet are off the ground. But I'll notice that even though both feet are off the ground, I still have the same positioning of my feet. I still end up in the same position as if I was dropping back. One other aspect of the sprint out happens at the end, at the end result. After you've exploded from the line of scrimmage and you've gotten your depth and you're going to turn the corner, a lot of coaches teach to force the line of scrimmage, to make that defense come to you and deliver the ball. I think that if you're going to have to throw, the, if your receiver is running short routes, that's fairly, fairly good, uh, good thought. But if you're going to run deeper routes and you're going to need some time, on the Seahawks, we run 25-yard routes, 23-yard routes, 30-yard routes off the sprint out to get the, to have the receivers get enough depth that they that the timing is proper we cannot force the line of scrimmage so when we hit our 11 yards our 15 yard depth we flatten it out and we don't we don't slow down but we don't try to make everything happen fast we go straight out so we're at a 15 yard depth running sideways I'm running sideways at 15 yards now when I see Steve or Sam or Steve Rabel, I see them guys getting ready to make their breaks. Then I, then I turn it up. Then I just come into it and I get my shoulders pointed towards the line of scrimmage. This is the most important part about the, about the sprint out, is your shoulders have to, have to come around through to deliver the ball. And only at the last minute do I turn, my, tur turn myself up the field. And this is one thing that is, that's probably the hardest thing to do about a sprint out, is to stay back. I've always wanted to get up towards that line of scrimmage. And what it does is it makes me get to the line of scrimmage so quickly that my receivers have never had a chance to come out of their breaks. It also uh, makes, you, makes you make your decisions too quickly. If you're running flat, you've got 15 yards to play with. You can run towards the line of scrimmage a little bit. If the receivers are taking a little bit longer in their break, they didn't come out when you thought, you still have a little time to play with to deliver the ball. And the run and shoot, or the sprint out that the high school coaches are teaching, doesn't allow that. You've got to come, and it's almost a run first, pass second type of offense. But in our case, it's a pass first, run second. I have the option to run, but that's only a consideration after my receivers are covered. Okay, Jim, you've talked about deep drop, short drop, sprint out. How about a little deception? Yeah, and, sc and scramble, too. How about the play pass? The play action pass is uh, a third, almost a third of the game uh, to, to me. Handing off is, running and throwing and all that is, but play action is, is a third of the game because play action not only happens when you're going to do, actually not give them the ball and fake, but it also happens when you do give them the ball. A play does not end for a quarterback when he gives them the ball. If you watch me uh, play quarterback on television or uh, in, a, in a game live, you'll just think that I'm the weirdest person in the world because I give the ball off <clears throat> to somebody and I continually fake, try to fake the defense out to, to, uh, I continually try to fake the defense out into letting them believe that I still have the ball. Now, to do this, it takes, it takes you to concentrate on your faking when you're giving the ball off and when you're not giving the ball off. It all has to look the same. Norm, why don't you stand behind me, and I want you to come up, and I'm going to hand you the ball, and I'll say go, and I just want you to walk through it. Now, I'm down in my position, I snap the ball and the ball comes into my stomach because when I turn my back I'm going to be very deceptive. So I get the snap. Ready? Go! 
Now I hand him the ball here. I had it in. The, I had it. I had it here, and I hand it to him here. And now I let him take it, but I still have my hands in like I have the football. And I continually, I continue to set up as if I'm going to throw a play action pass. And I'll go through the whole motion. I'll hit that step, and I'll set up, and I'll I'll deliver the ball sometimes. I'm trying to make everything look exactly the same. So get back here again, Norm. So when it does happen, the same play has been called. The defense has seen it. I take the snap, go, and I, I look at it. I say, he's got the ball. And I give him the hand, and I come back here, and I hit that fifth or sixth step, and I come, and I deliver the ball. And I wouldn't throw it to you, Norm. <laughs> but everything works that way. Uh, reverse spins. As soon as you reverse your... Nobody knows where the ball is, so you can't have the ball out here faking like this, so you have to have it in here. You have to have it into your gut. And then let them see the ball. Let people see the ball. The linebackers, defensive linemen, they have to see the ball. So you can't just throw a hand out there. That doesn't look like much of a fake, but they've got, come on this side. So I'm going to reverse pivot. I'm going to let you see it, but I'm going to pull it back, and then I'll give you a hand. Everything is done with two hands. One hand is always released to do the faking. So it's coming out here. Two hands. One goes out and the other comes in. And then you bring the ball, then you bring your hand back after you've, after you've let everybody see it. Then you bring your hand back and get it on the ball and then you're ready to throw. Now, to hand the ball off, again, we always bring the ball into our, to our guts, our chest high. And when we're going to deliver the ball to a, a, a belly, and I'm going to show it on this side again, always look, look where you're going to hand it. Don't, don't do any of this. Uh, oh, yeah, you're right there. You can get very confused. So when you're going to hand the ball, you take your step, and you look the ball in. It's just a split second. You, you start it out with two hands, and then you let go. And you bring, that, you bring this one hand back to continue your fake, and you let your hand go, and you bring both hands back, and then you continue on your fake. Now here, a, a problem that you can have is hitting elbows. Elbows, they hurt, they uh, make fumbles, and here's what happens. Go, Norm. You can hand the ball too high or too low. And a lot of times, the reason is, is running backs are a little bit smaller than Norm, and, they, and they're bent over when they're running. They run at this slanted angle, so they're lower. And if you're a quarterback and you're standing up here, you're going to hit this guy right in the face, even if you're looking. So what a quarterback has to do is, if the running back is bent over, a quarterback has to get down on his level. So a quarterback has to play with a little bit of a bent knee as he's faking, as he's doing this handoff. So I'm going to open up, and I'm going to get down here. I'm going to get on his level so I can see exactly where the ball has to go. And I don't have to stand here like this to try to hand him the ball. I'm down in, in kind of a bent knee position where I can give him the ball and then get out of it myself. OK? All right, let's talk about, you've talked about the handwork giving the ball off. Let's talk about the techniques, the motion, uh, the feel, the, all of the business that goes on, the control, the touch with delivering the pass itself. Okay, there should be a shifting of your arms or a shifting of the ball from shoulder to shoulder. Not wildly, not way out here like this, but as you're dropping back and you're in a rhythm, the ball should be shifted from shoulder to shoulder. And the only reason for that is it's, it's so much quicker. You can get back so much quicker because everything's working on your body uh, together and if you if you went back like this your legs are working but there's a stiffness in your upper body and you've got to be relaxed so the ball's up here now as you set up and I and I've taught this at quarterback camps and I see it all the time is uh, young quarterbacks they get so sloppy and older quarterbacks get sloppy too but you've got to drive it into your the frontal lobe of your brain it's got to be at the utmost not to drop the ball down by your side because what goes down if the ball goes down it's got to come back up to deliver because the delivery of the ball has to be somewhere in this range somewhere up above your head and to be able to deliver that the ball has to be there 
and I see so many quarterbacks, they hit that, they hit that back step and that ball goes right down here because either it's cool, I don't know what it is, but it just feels good just to do this. And so you hit that seventh step and the ball comes down and then you bring it back up and that's so wasted. So the ball should never go down. The ball should stay here. You should hit that seventh step. You should sit up in the pocket and just deliver the ball. Concentrate on not wasting any motion at all. The only way to deliver, I think, to continually improve on your passing is to get out of one fault of a sidearm throw. And that's probably the only thing I can teach you to, or to tell a quarterback not to do. Try to stay away from the sidearm. And throwing it sidearm is just what it says. The ball can be up here, and then your shoulder drops, and the ball goes sidearm. It's, it's poor because you, you, you lose control. It's, it's a lower trajectory to the receiver. Uh, it's, it's an awkward motion. You can improve to a point, but you cannot improve as a skilled quarterback. You cannot learn to throw the ball with touch, with accuracy, as well as you can if you release the ball up a little bit higher. And upon the release, the ball's up here, and you're, you're standing sideways to the line of scrimmage to begin with. You cannot drop back to pass and end up throwing a ball like with your shoulders already parallel to the line of scrimmage. There's got to be a rotation. So as you drop back, you're, you're sideways to begin with, and you, continually to, you continue to stay sideways. And as you step up into the pocket, as you're getting ready to deliver, now you rotate your hips and your shoulders at the same time. And this brings a lot of extra power and uh, a, a great motion to your throwing arm. It just, everything, I'm just saying it has to be done that way. All right? That's where your power for your throw comes from. Exactly. It's okay. where you're going to get all the power. It's where you're going to end up getting your uh, accuracy, your skill. It, it's all in the rotation, okay? It's almost like a, a javelin thrower, except it's not as violent unless you're throwing fairly long. And all the motion that you're throwing with, your whole body should be going forward. Now, some quarterbacks might have the trouble of throwing, falling back. Well, obviously, you're going to lose so much power in your arm. Uh, you're going to lose accuracy. You're going to lose confidence because you're, you're, you're wanting to get the ball there, but it's just not getting there. And the setup, the stepping forward, is all getting all your body motion to go forward. So as you set up and as you're going forward, you'll have no trouble following through and stepping. Uh, one other thing to control this falling back type of motion is to open your stride up with your front leg. The, the leg that you kick forward, you can really stride out. When you see me throw the football hard, I am, I am really, really stretched out. I'm so low to the ground, it almost, it almost seems that I'm going to be so low I can't see over the wide receivers, but I've already seen them. So I'm just th I'm throwing it. I can see him. But I always open my stride up, and that gives me a lot of power also. So I've dropped back. I've opened my stride up. I've, I've turned my shoulders towards the line of scrimmage. And now the arm. OK, the arm has to be. It can be anywhere in here. It can't be here, and it can't be here. But it can be. What coach, every, what coach can tell a player that he's not throwing the ball correctly if the coach hasn't understood of certain throws to begin with. Now, the coach might notice that the boy, or, or you might notice yourself as the quarterback, that you're not getting the proper power on the ball. The ball's just not going right for you. Something's wrong. You've got to a point, and it's just, ugh. A couple things. You could be releasing the ball too high. Coaches say, get the ball up high. Well, you could be releasing it too high. Or you might be throwing a sidearm. Are, or you could be gripping the ball improperly. Now, every quarterback, as in their throw from here to there is different, their grip is going to be different because their hands are different. A guy with smaller hands can't grip the ball the same as a guy with large hands. The grip on the ball on this side of the ball is going to be different with 
every quarterback. No quarterback, some quarterbacks like Terry Bradshaw, he puts his index finger on the back of the ball and throws it. And it beats me how he does it, but he does it. Uh, I hold the ball like this. I have, I have two fingers on the threads <clears throat> and two fingers off. The most important thing about the grip is not this side. It's this side. It's the back side. Now, I want to show you this very closely. Some quarterbacks who are having some severe trouble, trouble in getting a lot of power on the ball is because this part of their hand is closed, meaning that there's no gap in here. A, a young quarterback or any quarterback, including myself or any around the National Football League, if you if you look at the quarterbacks that are throwing the ball well, you'll notice that they'll have a pocket in their hand on the palm. You'll be able to stick your index finger in there. Now the reason for the cup in your palm, it forces you to grip the ball with your fingertips all the way around the ball. It gives you a proper grip. If you have a, a quarterback that's having trouble with this, ask him, let me see your grip, and then turn it over. If he doesn't have a uh, a, a cup in there, ask him to move his thumb down a little bit farther on the ball. Or you yourself, if you're having this problem, move your thumb down on the ball a little bit, forming a cup in here that you can stick your finger in. Okay. Now, the very last part of the throw would be the release, and this is really key. To throw a football, you have the ball and you're going to release it, and you're going to throw your thumb down and out. Now, I'm going to come straight at you. So when your hand's back here and you're gripped on the ball, you're coming through and your arm is extending, but as it's extending, you're pushing your arm, I mean your thumb, down and out. You're making it go weird, like it doesn't want to go. And the reason for this is when your thumb goes down, your fingers have to follow. And it's the fingers that are the key thing. Your fingers force the ball to come off your hand with a lot of power, it kicks the nose up, it puts that ball into a real tight spiral, and it makes that ball just zip off your arm. If you're throwing the ball with your thumb going out and over the top, or you're following through across this way, you're going to have trouble. Don't change your motion if, you're, if you've got success with it. But if you don't have success or you want to try to improve some way or the other, try it this way. It'll, it's amazing what happens to, and, what, and how you'll improve with your throwing. You know, there's many strategies in offense, and there's many philosophies that everyone uses. But there's certain principles, I think, that you must remember when you coach offensive football. And our concept in professional level is not much different, I don't guess, than the concept in any level. We just feel like that whenever we have the football, that we don't want to give it up without a touchdown or a successful kick. I believe that this is where teams are successful offensively. If you can avoid the errors that they lose field position, if you keep the ball under control and you keep the pressure on the defense, you're going to be successful from an offensive standpoint. So what we try to do ourselves is to try to get that touchdown when we get that ball. And if we're not able to, be, uh, to reach the touchdown, then we want to have a successful kick to create that field position that causes the other team to move a long way if they're going to beat us. Oh, <laughs> my